Hi, welcome to the globally uh, to the globally important agricultural heritage systems webinar. I'm Edin Machivi, um, a member of the Slow Food International Executive Committee and uh, the Slow Food uh, International Vice President, uh, hosting you uh, to this uh, webinar on the globally. Uh, uh, on the globally important agricultural heritage systems. Theme on agroforestry systems and sustainability in Africa. The uh, globally important agricultural heritage systems uh, as, uh, those systems that exhibit the utmost responsibility of mankind in history when it comes to the management of the planet and also management of the resources which uh, make all of us uh, thrive on this planet. And they, are, uh, they show us how humanity has lived for the past centuries in harmony with nature. And the, uh, the, the global, these globally important agricultural heritage systems are not only outstand, outstanding aesthetic, uh, aesthetic beauty, uh, combining important agriculture, uh, agrobiodiversity, resilient ecosystems and uh, cultural heritage, but there are also uh, important landscapes of strong gastronomic identity, biocultural and livelihood survival of many indigenous uh, uh, societies around the world. It's unfortunate today that we learn of serious threats to these important systems due to the greed of the present day mankind, coupled with environmental threats like climate change, imbalances in growth and development opportunities between cities and rural areas where most of these systems are located also serves to the disadvantage of the globally important agricultural heritage site, uh, systems. We should therefore combine efforts to support the existence of the globally important agricultural heritage systems by working in favor of development mechanisms that respect the value of these systems. And on the same note, we should, uh, uh, on, on this same note, we convene uh, today to build on our knowledge about these systems as one of the ways uh, we can assist them to thrive. We have a number of speakers uh, today who will be sharing with us, and I call upon your active participation in this forum. Please uh, 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 to participate uh, actively in this forum, you need to use the question and answer icon on your Zoom sc on your screen. And this is where you can put your questions, where you can put your comments, uh, such that the panelists, the, 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 the rich panel which we have can respond to these questions. As I said already, that we have quite a number of speakers who are going to share with us the knowledge as one of the ways we can support these systems to thrive. We can support uh, the agroforestry systems and sustainability in Africa. We can support the globally important agricultural heritage systems uh, in the whole world. I would like to introduce our first uh, speaker uh, today, talking about the, uh, uh, the uh, building capacity uh, international course, uh, Professor Mauro Agnoletti. He's the coordinator of the building, uh, building capacity programs and works uh, with FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, together with the Italian Corporation on the, uh, uh, to coordinate uh, capacity building projects and also uh, learning activities. And he's part of the uh, uh, strong and um, well, uh, capacitated scientists we have. Please, Professor Mauro Agnoletti. Thank you. 
Eddy for this presentation and good afternoon to everyone. As you heard, uh, we are discussing, we are talking here today of the global important agricultural heritage system. Uh, this uh, seminar is specific, uh, specifically dedicated to, um, to Africa. And uh, as you can see from my first slide, uh, this uh, GIGAS program is uh, currently supported by several countries. Um, Italy is one of the countries who has invested more in uh, promoting this program. Uh, currently, this GIGAS capacity building project, which is financed by the Italian Agency for the Cooperation, International Cooperation, is executed by our department, the Department of Agriculture, Food Environmental Management, and uh, specifically by the Laboratory for Landscape uh, placed in our department. Uh, what is this uh, exactly uh, about the project? Uh, it's, it's good to remember uh, uh, the definition of GS. Uh, remarkable land use system and landscape, which are rich in biological diversity, evolving from the co-adaptation of a rural community with its environment, and it needs an aspiration for sustainable development. So already from this definition, and differently from other program of, of the UN, uh, you understand here, we are focusing on rural community and the uh, agricultural system that maintain uh, a feature that are related to their culture, uh, to their traditions, uh, and they are sustainable in terms of showing us uh, example of adaptation to different climate and environmental condition. And this definition also suggests that uh, we are dealing with uh, agricultures that are not really, cannot be defined as uh, industrial agriculture. Uh, not too many people knows, but today in the world, industrial agriculture has not been successful in many areas of the world. They are not uh, uh, capable of sustaining this kind of intensive agriculture. In other terms, uh, these modern uh, techniques uh, are often using high external energy inputs, uh, uh, mostly dedicated to producing more and uh, keep the labor costs down with the low labor cost. Uh, as a matter of fact, in most of the area of the world where we have agriculture developed, we understand a situation where we cannot apply these intensive methods, but people have developed uh, an agriculture which is uh, characterized by uh, a, low, a lower, much lower uh, energy inputs where you have a high quality of the food production and where you have maybe a higher cost of labor, but the, for this form of agriculture, it's much more sustainable. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the different uh, uh, criteria uh, for applying to a GSI, so the criteria that uh, in uh, the scientific advisory group of the FAO that I'm chairing, we select and we approve the potential GSI, you see that uh, we speak about food and livelihood security. And in this case, I would like to remember that uh, uh, it's already a couple of years, the FAO together with uh, the target of feeding the world, so somehow resolving the problem of hunger, has indicated as a goal for the activity of FAO the quality, food quality. And food quality means not only one main thing that we are not no more looking to the, the matter of feeding all the population in the world. But uh, the point is also to feed with high quality food. So in this respect, producing uh, high quality food in this area, it's uh, a way for one, from one side to ensure uh, also that uh, the health conditions uh, are met in this area. So we're not feeding the population, feeding with high quality product, but also a way of promoting the uh, economy of this area. And this is one of the most important problem. And it's referred to a problem which is affecting uh, um, many different areas of in all the continents. Uh, and in fact, one may think that this cannot relate to Europe, uh, but can relate more, for instance, to Africa or the South America. But as a matter of fact, on this objective, uh, 
to maintain agriculture in, in areas of the world where the environmental conditions are very difficult, where we have a lot of abandonment, where we have pro problems of uh, aging of the population. So farmers are not only leaving this area to, in order to go to live in the cities, but also the, those who remain in this area are old, older people. Okay, this problem puts together from China to Morocco, from Italy to South America, many different countries. So it's a worldwide effort, uh, which as I understand is trying to hit a uh, different target, but in this specific aspect of food and criteria, we are also trying to develop uh, a different model for this agriculture areas based uh, okay, on food production, but also, for instance, on promoting uh, tourism that can support uh, the, the farmers living in this area, discovering not only a high quality pro product, but also enjoy uh, landscape that are not only beautiful, but are the result of centuries, in some case, millennium of uh, activities of humans mm, that have really created unique places. And also in, in this respect, uh, these forms of agriculture are very much uh, characterized uh, by the agrobiodiversity. In FAO terms, everyone knows biodiversity, of course, uh, maybe not everyone knows specifically agrobiodiversity, but even less people know biocultural diversity. As a matter of fact, agrobiodiversity is included in the preamble to the FAO criteria in the more general topic of biocultural diversity. So what we are uh, talking about here is that uh, in uh, all this area where you have agriculture, forestry, or livestock grazing uh, uh, develop uh, across the centuries, uh, what you have actually, it's a biodiversity characterized by uh, being the result of the interrelationship between man and nature. This means that some species uh, that we have, they are not animal but vegetal species, are the result of this co-adaptation they create a biodiversity that can be typically classified as biocultural. It's not only a definition given by FAO in this specific program, but is the result of a joint program between UNESCO and the Convention on Biological Diversity. And so this kind of biodiversity is very important because differently from the biodiversity that you have in what we can consider natural area, area not affected by the man, where the man is considered often as a disturbance factor. In this case, instead, uh, the farmers uh, is at the center of the system. So uh, we do not only speak of a man which is not negatively affecting the biodiversity, but uh, in this case, the man is necessary to have this level of biodiversity. And this biodiversity is obviously connected to this agricultural system. And uh, this agrobiodiversity is equally supported by traditional knowledge, uh, which is uh, at, the, uh, at the foundation of this program. You cannot have a GSR without a traditional uh, system in place. Uh, and you cannot have a traditional system in place if you don't have cultural value existing in the area for a long time. And in fact, uh, what is surprising, what is amazing, uh, using other words in these places, is that uh, wherever you go to visit the GSI, you see there's a lot of history there. And not history, not, not, not just the passing of the time. It's just that people knows how to adapt and to survive in an area where most of our modern farmers uh, or most of the normal people would not think it's possible to survive. And so this is very important because you have often in extreme climatic condition on mountain areas where you have steep slope or, or in desert area. But nevertheless, uh, although the climatic condition, environmental condition in general are so difficult, people have learned how to survive. So another objective of the program is to make a sort of an inventory of all these different systems existing in the world and to take advantage of the knowledge that you have there. And in the case of our project, we try to formalize this knowledge uh, through teaching and to scientific test uh, in order to spread this information. In other, in other words, uh, of course, we are saving places that are threatened by 
different uh, problem and are risking to disappear. But, but we try to learn the lessons and to use this lesson in other parts of the world where this can be useful in order to make a, a living possible, even in the worst climatic conditions. So that's the, the real, one of the most important aspects of these places. And together with the culture of values, you see there is a social organization. As well in this area, the social organization is uh, very much connected to the food production, to the agrobiodiversity, and to traditional knowledge. And that, that's why really we can call them a system. And last but not least, the landscape. Uh, landscape, so for until recently, was considered like the beauty. Okay, uh, you see a beautiful place, so and this aesthetic value is considered what is important when uh, enjoying or assessing uh, uh, a landscape. Well, in the case of FAO, and I have to say that the scientific committee worked a lot in the last uh, years to change a bit the, the content of this criteria, is seen as the result of the integration of economic, social, and environmental processes in time and space. So actually what you see here is that all the previous uh, criteria, the food, the agrobiodiversity, traditional knowledge and culture, they create the landscape and they also give to the landscape the unique feature they made these uh, places uh, really so important, not only for the people living there, but also for people like us visiting, visiting this area. And all this, uh, the activity, all these criteria that uh, I have presented today are meeting many of the SDG or the 2030 agenda. So FAO and AGS program, as many other programs, I would say almost all the programs, are requested to meet uh, the SDG. Uh, in this case, I'm happy to say that uh, not only the FAO, but other organizations like the IPCC and uh, the, C the CBD found that this kind of agriculture is, the, is exactly one of those type of agriculture meeting all the goals that relate not only with hunger, but with biodiversity, with climate mitigation and adaptation. And this, of course, it's also the content uh, of our uh, agricultural uh, heritage system project here in Florence, where we have a teaching based on all this uh, topic. Some more words about this project. There are two main goals uh, that we are carrying out. Uh, one is the ident identification of potential geosite. Mostly we are looking for site uh, in the countries of the Italian cooperation abroad uh, uh, program. And so this means that all the students coming from these uh, areas uh, are identifying uh, together with us this potential geosite. But we have not only students joining the master coming from these uh, countries. We have many other students coming from countries that are not uh, uh, supported, but this can uh, is actually happening because also we have grants given by the regional government of Tuscany, but by the FAO itself. So we have a, a large set of students that we can support uh, in our master course. And why we, we, we do this master course? Because what we find out uh, uh, trying to study this system is we, we do not only lack of scientific information. There is just not really a formalization, as I said before, of this kind of agriculture form. We have, for instance, some way of managing agriculture, like uh, uh, those based on ecology, based on the sustainable management. Uh, but uh, what we are looking for here is to create a manager that knows all the uh, skills and the information related to all the different criteria and are able to only to locate these sites but also to manage them so we have a very high interdisciplinarity i would say more transdisciplinarity more than interdisciplinarity so to create a set of skills that can be used in all these different areas of the world where these uh, managers uh, young managers are able really to understand how a system Word and also to intervene. Also, because in this program, one thing is to apply for becoming a GSI, but one of the most interesting thing is to develop what we call the action plan. So we have what we might 
described as a, a project for rural development. So we're not only the local population, but also the, the, the policy, political uh, the politics is called to support uh, this uh, uh, development program. And we are speaking about the dynamic conservation, which means we are not focusing on maintaining a picture or, or a photograph of this area, but we try to develop uh, uh, also the economy in this area. So we have uh, students coming from different countries. This is the uh, 2019 uh, edition. But uh, as you see from uh, the two editions that we already had, uh, although the one we had last year was severely affected by the COVID-19, uh, we found out uh, that uh, nevertheless, we were able to carry out all the courses uh, and get to the end of the master co course assigning the title. And also, also one may think that COVID-19 does not relate much to this topic, but it's the contrary. In a study that we did, at least for Italy, with the uh, Central European Bank uh, in Frankfurt, uh, we found out that uh, the number of infection in rural areas are, are much less than in the other areas, not because of the density of the population, but there is a high correlation between the development model and the number of infection. This means that rural areas are characterized by low energy inputs, so far uh, with by agriculture that are not intensified, uh, you have less chances to have uh, the presence of the virus. Uh, and also this call for an inversion of politics that today especially in, in many many rich countries, but not only in, in the country of the north of the world. Uh, uh, a development model where you have an intensive agriculture in some small area, where you also have infrastructure, where you also have urban area, where you, where you also have industry, where you have also agro-industry. And this concentration, of course, is the one that causes, at least in our study, a high concentration of uh, infection. So therefore, reducing the density and creating services for allowing the people to survive and live in this area, especially in developing countries, is something that uh, uh, could be very successful. Also, from the economic point of view, we have already results, especially in China, but in some area of Italy, where the selling of the food coming from this area has already achieved uh, a market price uh, which is higher, much higher in case, in some cases, the double of the same product produced outside the GS side, which means that people know that coming from a GS side, the product has an advantage. So I think that I finished my intervention. I hope uh, I was uh, in time. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um... Professor Mauro uh, Agnoletti, uh, the coordinator of the building uh, uh, capacity program and also the uh, uh, president of the scientific committee of the FAO program on the observation of the uh, globally important agricultural heritage site. He was giving us a thorough introduction uh, to the glo uh, globally important agricultural heritage sites, but as well as uh, also uh, taking us through what the capacity building uh, project uh, has done and has achieved uh, all around the world. So we move uh, on to uh, our next speaker. I want to uh, kindly remind you all to use the Q&A uh, function. And uh, for, uh, for translation, like we said, uh, uh, at the beginning for translation, we have two channels, uh, the French and also the uh, English channel. Click uh, on the interpretation function and you select your preferred uh, language uh, for the forum. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Marco uh, Focacci. Uh, Dr. Marco Focacci uh, works uh, at the Italian Agency for International Cooperation. Uh, he's going to look at agroforestry from uh, 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 the international uh, the perspective uh, uh, at the from the perspective of the International Cooperation Agency. So, welcome, Dr. Uh, Marco Focacci. Uh, good afternoon, for everybody. Uh, to everybody, and uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to this webinar. I am uh, Marco Focacci from uh, Italian Agency of International Cooperation. 
and I'm working in the uh, Human Development uh, Office and also advisor of the capacity building project of uh, the University of Florence. And, and I thank Professor Agnoletti for uh, anticipating uh, a few concepts that I will uh, also um, treat in my, my speech. Um, for me, it's a pleasure today to, to be here uh, because I have the possibility to, um, to talk about a few concepts that, uh, concept that, uh, that are uh, important from the perspective uh, uh, of international uh, cooperation. As, uh, uh, as Italian agency, um, we work in development and uh, working uh, in development means dealing with uh, uh, context in uh, continuous evolution. Uh, where the actions that we are undertake uh, today uh, must have a temporal projection uh, of at least 30 years uh, to be effective. Uh, so before entering the, the subject, I would like to uh, speak about uh, this, uh, uh, this frame. Um, in other words, when uh, um, uh, as agency, uh, we have to face uh, uh, issues and try to solve problems uh, and often emergency, not only problems uh, today, but our response uh, uh, should build strategies uh, that are able to um, anticipate and mitigate the effects of global mega trends uh, and when we speak about megatrends, we, we talk about those global changes that are going to, uh, to shape uh, uh, the world in the next future within, uh, as I said, the 30 years in the uh, medium long term. And I would like to mention uh, three uh, megatrends. Uh, the, first, the first one is the world population dynamics. By 2050, uh, the world population will reach more or less 9.7 billion people. At the moment, Asia has the highest uh, world po uh, population growth, uh, but uh, in the next years, uh, Africa will, uh, will take this leadership. So we'll have uh, in the next future, 2 billion people more to feed with a consequent uh, the consequences, consequences we can uh, imagine uh, in terms of uh, natural resource exploitation and pressure on natural environment. The second uh, mega trend is the urban growth uh, uh, rate. Uh, Professor Agnoletti already mentioned uh, the growing of, uh, of uh, and the movement of farmers from, uh, from uh, rural areas uh, to urban settlements. By 2050, um, between 60 to 75% uh, of our population will live uh, in, uh, uh, in urban settlements. And so we, we are observing a kind of weird uh, phenomenon because on one hand, uh, we'll have uh, uh, more people to feed, but at the same time, we will have uh, less people living uh, in, in rural areas where uh, actually the food is produced. On top of this, we have uh, climate change and I'm, I'm not going of course to, to say anything else otherwise we stay here uh, hours talking, talking about it. Um, so what's the uh, role of agroforestry systems uh, uh, in this framework? Uh, in my opinion, they can play a, a, a role of paramount importance. Um, and if I have to explain why I have in mind the two uh, keywords or concepts, the first one is, is resilience. Um, agroforestry systems are by definition resilient as they are the combination of different elements that interact each other in a dynamic balance. Um, it's already in the GIS criteria, uh, and I'm going to repeat a little bit, but uh, agroforestry systems um, provide the source of multiple uh, products. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, they build resilience in the communities that, that live uh, and, 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 uh, and rely 
on, uh, on, on this system because the, uh, the farmers that are living and, and implementing agroforestry system, systems um, do not rely only in one or two products, but they are more really resilient, uh, resilient uh, to, um, to changes, especially uh, in the context of the uh, uh, climate, uh, climate change. Um, also about uh, uh, food quality, uh, that is another very important issue. It's uh, acknowledged in the literature that highly diverse agricultural systems are, uh, have a direct correlation with also a uh, diverse domestic diet and nutrition. Uh, the second concept uh, is uh, knowledge. And maybe it's uh, even, for me, it's, maybe it's even more important than, than the previous one. Um, agroforestry systems are the results of a centuries old uh, adaptation and interaction between the uh, communities, the, the human communities and the, uh, um, and the environment. Um, the presence in the same area, the region or, or community uh, of a forestry component, this can be made up of just trees or trees and shrubs uh, and livestock and agricultural crops. Um, it's, uh, uh, it gives uh, a, um, a, a very important, uh, um, as, uh, very important aspects. Um, about the um, uh, the knowledge, uh, I would like to point out uh, uh, this uh, uh, this aspect. If we consider knowledge only from the um, technical point of view, uh, in agroforestry uh, agroforestry uh, we can define the, uh, in uh, uh, from the technical point of view like. Uh, um, Forest, uh, uh, forest farming, silvopasture, alley cropping. This is the technical uh, point of view. But none of this definition uh, can give us the real essence of, uh, uh, of an agroforestry system. That is the knowledge behind the technique. And for this reason, agroforestry systems are uh, site specific, uh, strictly related to the community that have developed uh, uh, that specific uh, um, system. So, uh, looking uh, at the agroforestry system uh, through this glance uh, leads us to the uh, direct to the concept of, uh, of the importance of the uh, GIS program, and also, uh, as already uh, uh, Professor Nialetti uh, mentioned, uh, give us a perspective uh, considering the, the the progressive, the massive abandonment of uh, rural areas, especially the most remote ones uh, that is we are observing and that we'll observe uh, more and more in the next future. So as an uh, Italian agency for uh, international cooperation, we decided and we are uh, uh, really committed to uh, support uh, the GIS program uh, because uh, the, the, uh, this program has an approach that put in the international debate a different perspective for development, which is not uh, the intensive agriculture, but is the, uh, a, a type of development that couples technique, but uh, with uh, um, knowledge. Uh, so uh, for us, it's very important, this coupling, because it gives us the possibility to look at the, uh, at the uh, next future with uh, uh, a, a key to, um, to face the, the new challenges of uh, the, these mega trends that I just mentioned and, and uh, the others uh, that I didn't. Uh, so uh, I, I like to conclude this. Um, I don't, I'm not going to, uh, to speak about other projects that we are running. Maybe that we have, if we have time, we will uh, uh, also can uh, can uh, answer to uh, some questions, but uh, yes, just to uh, again to to say that the GIS program 
uh, it's important because uh, although it's talking about uh, uh, agricultural heritage and uh, um, centuries old traditions, is uh, it's an approach and it's a program that is uh, looking uh, to the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marco. Uh, uh, talking about one of the uh, most traditional and uh, oldest uh, farming systems in Africa, agroforestry uh, farming systems is still widely being practiced in many communities in Africa, but the knowledge on agroforestry as uh, one of the most resilient production systems is very much under threat. This uh, brings us to our next speaker, uh, who is going to talk about uh, uh, who is going to talk about the role of traditional forest knowledge, uh, and this is uh, Dr. Professor Alfred uh, uh, Oteng Yeboa, a retired professor at the Department of Plant and Environmental Biology School of Biological Sciences of the University of Ghana. He started his university teaching career from uh, 1973 after his uh, PhD and has since taught in many uh, universities in Africa, including uh, Nigeria, Kenya, and his native uh, uh, country, Ghana. He has chaired many high profile local and international meetings on the environment, on the environment and biodiversity. And his interest in biodiversity spans several decades of research in various subjects, including local and traditional knowledge systems. Please, um, uh, Professor Alfred, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eddie. Uh, it's a big pleasure for me to uh, join this seminar. And I'm very grateful to Mauro Agnon uh, Letty, who persistently, within one week, uh, persuaded me to participate in this. Uh, because they, today, on the 1st of March, I had already been billed to speak to 15 students from West Africa. Uh, West Africa has a program which we call the West African Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And we train students every two years from the 15 countries. And I was giving them a series of lectures, which I finished just about an hour ago. Um, I have a presentation which actually was dictated by um, the organizers, and I'm very happy at least to speak on this because I have done some extensive work on traditional forest knowledge, and therefore it's a privilege for me to speak here. Um, I think I'll ask uh, Pago, uh, my colleague, uh, Pakogo, Marco, Marco, yes, to lead me. Yes, um, I have a, a very short outline, uh, the context under which I'm speaking, and what exactly is traditional forest knowledge, uh, the distribution of the world's forests, Africa's forest ecosystems, and its dependent communities, and the communities and their forests. And I'm asking finally a question, which I believe um, will be of interest to those who are the organizers, particularly what is the future of the relationship uh, of traditional forest knowledge uh, to food supply and poverty alleviation. So in the context that I was referring to, in fact, I am just expressing gratitude to uh, Mauro who insisted that I should participate in this. I tried to push him away from me, but knowing Mauro, we have known each other for a very long time. And so I consented, but I thought that it is a good thing for me uh, to spend some time, just about 10, 15 minutes to give you an idea of what actually is on the floor. So um, at least the context is actually on slow food at this annual uh, event, which is called Terra Madro Salon del Gusto. And therefore, it's my pleasure to elaborate on traditional forest knowledge and to further elucidate the role that it has and continues to play 
in Africa. And I will make a prediction of this particular role into the future. So considering what is traditional forest knowledge, it's a definition that I want to refer to, and it's actually coming from two sources. The first source is from Berkis and his colleagues who in 2000 gave a definition which they thought will take hold of forest issues. And this particular definition was adopted by the United Nations in 2004, which reads that traditional forest knowledge is a cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and beliefs that have been handed down from generations by cultural transmission and evolving by adaptive processes. In fact, all of these messages that I'm referring to have been mentioned in passing by Mauro when he talked about the uh, cultural, biocultural diversity and so on. It's all coming through adaptive processes. So you see these relationships between living things or living beings, including humans, with one another and also with their forest environment. So you can immediately see those of you who may be familiar with the Convention on Biological Diversity. This particular convention took pains to look at traditional knowledge and it actually adopted it within its Article 8J. And I can't read the whole thing, but the Article 8J is referring to everything to do with human living cultural systems within local people or within traditional people. Everything, including how they eat, the languages that they use, the articles that they develop, the lifestyles that they have, all of these, the innovations that come as a result of experiences that they get going through their normal activities. So you see, Article 8J is a very, very important article within the convention. And traditional forest knowledge, which is now being picked up from the whole concept of Article 8J is actually considering forests. So with this definition, you can see that traditional knowledge systems is a knowledge, innovation, and practices of indigenous and local communities around the whole world. And of course, as I have indicated, this knowledge has developed from experience which has been gained over centuries, over centuries, and adapted to local culture and environment, and therefore has become a traditional knowledge which is transmitted orally from generation to generation. And it has involved many things, uh, plant species, animal breeds. There are many things. And it's also found practicability in such fields as in agriculture, fisheries, health, horticulture, and forestry. So in all of these, you find traditional knowledge systems uh, being referred to. So with this understanding, traditional knowledge can be seen as synonymous to indigenous knowledge. Those of you who are familiar with maybe only indigenous knowledge or traditional environmental or ecological knowledge or local ecological knowledge. All of these are together forming what the bigger concept of traditional forest knowledge is uh, referring to. So they all refer to the long-standing traditions and practices in certain regions indigenous and local communities, and it encompasses, and this is the important part here, it encompasses wisdom, knowledge, and so on. Okay. Now, I have a diagram which is indicating the distribution of the world's tropical forests. And I think at the first sight, you realize that the tropical forests are mostly within the tropic area. Uh, longitude, latitudes, uh, latitude 13 degrees south, 13 degrees north of the equator. And you can see all the green patches are indicating forest zones. Next slide, please. So when we come to look at the nature of Africa's forest ecosystems and its dependent communities, you will see that in Africa, dry forest types predominate 
throughout sub-Saharan Africa, with the exception of the moist regions of the Congo Basin and parts of West Africa and also the Ethiopian highlands, Uganda and the easternmost Democratic Republic of Congo. The fry, dry forests actually are mostly deciduous and semi-deciduous broadleaf and parkland forests. But typically the tropical moist forests include lowland evergreen broadleaf rainforests, semi-evergreen moist broadleaf forests, lower and upper montane forests, especially you find in uh, Kenya, parts of Uganda and Rwanda, uh, um, Ethiopia, and, and so on. And uh, yeah, so this is this is the a close uh, look at the uh, forest cover within Africa. If you go to the next slide, you will see therefore that the communities in these locations are those who over countless generations have populated such areas of forests and also have depended on the fauna and flora for their survival. And as a result, this long experience that the communities have accumulated have formed a body, a significant body of knowledge on sustainable conservation, sustainable harvesting, sustainable processing, and utilization of forest resources. So what is it that connects these people to their well-being? Uh, this issue can be illustrated in the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. And of course, this can be again illustrated through uh, understanding of land use and land cover, landscape governance practices of shifting cultivation, agroforestry systems, um, available uh, resources, including wild foods and healthcare, and in all of these activities of conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, you will find that there is food security. You also find that poverty is eradicated in these societies. And the societies actually remain um, healthy and resilient. So as indicated and used here, land use is actually for the purposes of land which serve, for example, wildlife habitat or agriculture, and land cover referring to the surface cover on the ground, whether for vegetation or whatever that you want to use. But the important part is that both situations are initiated through the process of land clearing, which is an activity undertaken by the communities. Now, the process of land clearing and what to do on the soil relates to the socio-economical experiences of the people. What is it that they want on the ground for which they have cleared the land? And when you consider, uh, for example, land use, next slide, please. Yeah, so in land use and land cover, you have the practice of shifting cultivation, which is a traditional knowledge system, which determines natural resource management within villages to sustain their livelihoods and enhance adaptive capacity, which again is coming back to the issue of biocultural diversity, to sustain livelihoods and enhance adaptive capacity of the socio-ecological systems that prevail in that area. It also involves the periodic clearing of secondary forest patches, retaining useful plants and tree species. All of these are actually describing agroforestry. And of course, these practices modify the structure and composition of forest landscapes, uh, increasing their value to farmers and provide domestic needs and additional income for households. Next slide, please. So looking at agro forestry in perspective, you see that in the role of this kind of management practice of shifting cultivation is in the regulation of vegetation development, land and forest productivity, ensuring abundance and management of other natural resource components. At least 
we can say that this practice can be used to describe and characterize forest dynamics, changes that take place, or the trends of changes that take place in forests, which is an important characteristic of forest structure and the mosaic, which later are carefully understood in several levels of vegetation development. So the reference to this practice as the source of emergence of agroforestry uh, in terms of cash or profit crop or food crops is unimaginable. So through this, agro-biodiversity has flourished with abundant biodiversity. And of course, you, don't, you now have cash crops in most of our uh, forest areas. Cocoa, coffee, tea, oil palm, coconut, these are all planted purely for uh, commercial purposes by small scale farmers. Then you have food crops, mainly to uh, feed the population, maize, rice, millet, sorghum, and so on, including uh, tomatoes, garden eggs, pepper, sweet potato, onions, granuts, and so on, a whole host of uh, food crops which are available to the people. And that is the reason why food scarcity actually in those areas of the forest areas is not very common. Now, I make a reference to socio-ecological production landscapes. This is because this is now understood as the emerging trend. Uh, and I think those of you who are interested in the globally uh, important agricultural heritage systems, uh, you may have to take this on board because this is what is providing us with a mosaic of uh, uh, landscapes which are productive. And all of these have come through the use of appropriate and diverse indigenous technologies which have permeated tropical agriculture and forests and agroforest estates. And as I have indicated, some of these are those for soil management, including soil cover fertility and amelioration for smart agriculture which have led to proliferation of luxuriant socio-ecological production landscapes, which in short is referred to as sepals, which provide the socio-economic needs of the different farming communities. Now, the important point is that the presence of these sepals in many communities has shaped the outlook of the people with an implied and effective covenance, uh, governance on economic independence, social stability, and hope for the future. So the landscapes, which are the sepals, are providing ecosystems uh, services in support of such novel ideas as smart agriculture, which are known now to counter the effects of environmental challenges, including climate crisis of uh, climate crisis, including uh, land degradation and losses of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Now, from these, you will find that the communities are still also able to pick non-timber forest products. And of course, these are normally associated with forest ecosystems and in abundance and will never be in short supply uh, so long as these indigenous practices and the technologies uh, out there are cherished, applied, uh, and are used. So coming to conclusion, what future is available for traditional forest knowledge? The red alert that has been shown on the environmental dashboards by all the global environmental, uh, environmental agreements and conventions point to something. One, indicating a global crisis in resource depletion. That's the first thing. Therefore, the learning from global biodiversity and ecosystem assessments from the reports of IFBIS utilizes all knowledge systems, including traditional forest or traditional knowledge systems. Therefore, reflecting on the slow food objectives, which I have picked up among others to prevent the disappearance of the cultures and traditions and to combat people's dwindling interests in the food that they eat and so on, 
And therefore, considering the challenge of seeking solutions from nature to build back better and give opportunities that are provided in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals for the 2030 Global Agenda, all of these point to a need for immediate action. And the immediate action is that traditional forest knowledge systems have roles in human well-being and should be seen along with the holders properly documented, protected, and used. And in conclusion, I am saying that all these observations that I have made point to the need for immediate global, regional, and national actions. And I would like to submit that traditional forest knowledge systems have uh, in the creation many of the observations that are linked to proper functioning of the life supporting systems for human well-being. Thank you very much, Eddie, uh, Chair, and thank you also for listening to me. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, it's really a great honor from, to, learn from, uh, try to learn from this experience. It's true uh, uh, that uh, knowledge systems are really uh, very important and they need to be uh, preserved, especially on highly sensitive ecological places like forests. And uh, it's uh, through dr uh, drawing from this uh, knowledge and experience from the communities um, that uh, communities have, uh, have uh, accumulated over time, it is uh, this uh, knowledge uh, that uh, communities use to preserve ecosystems and the biodiversity they are in. So uh, in this, uh, you can find uh, slow food presidia use, uh, community, uh, which are uh, in situ biodiversity conservation projects uh, 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 driving uh, on this kind of knowledge and experience of the communities to preserve biodiversity. This pushes us to our next speaker who is uh, going to uh, talk about the link between the uh, globally important agricultural heritage system sites and the slow food presidia in North Africa. And uh, this will be uh, Dr. Nazarena uh, Lanza uh, uh, from uh, uh, Slow Food. Uh, uh, Nazarena is uh, an agrotechnician and anthropologist. And after six years between uh, uh, working for six years between Morocco and Senegal for her PhD, she returned to Italy in 2015 to coordinate slow food activities in North Africa and the Middle East. She's passionate about food, agriculture, and local traditions, and she investigates some of the most representative supply chains in the area, considering them first and foremost as cultural heritages linked to the local agricultural traditions. Uh, Nazarena, you're welcome, and uh, the audience is uh, much waiting to hear from you. Uh, merci beaucoup, Eddie. Je vais intervenir en français, donc je laisse le temps que les personnes puissent changer ou se connecter à la traduction. Euh, merci beaucoup aux, aux organisateurs pour m'avoir euh, invité à participer à ce panel qui, qui, qui m'intéresse beaucoup. En fait, j'ai été, été formée depuis le début de, 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 de ces cycles de, de webinaires. Et, et qui m'a fait en fait réfléchir sur les connexions entre les sites CIPAM, CIPAM le terme français pour les GIS, et les projets Slow Food, euh, du moins dans l'ère géographique dont je m'occupe. Et, et donc j'ai été très contente de répondre à la demande de parler ce soir des ponts possibles entre CIPAM et Slow Food. Euh, je travaille depuis des années euh, pour Slow Food, Région MENA, euh, Moyen-Orient et Nord d'Afrique, avec l'objectif principal de supporter et promouvoir des sentinelles slow food. Sentinelles, c'est le terme français pour euh, presidia. Donc, des sentinelles slow food écosystémiques, euh, c'est-à-dire liées aux paysages ruraux historiques et, et donc qui fonctionnent parfaitement tant avec les contextes naturels que celui artificiel dans lequel elles ont été réalisées. Une sentinelle, pour dire deux mots sur ce projet très important de Slow Food, 
se réfère à des produits emblématiques et en danger de disparition d'un territoire. Il peut indiquer des variétés végétales, des races animales, mais aussi des produits issus de la transformation pour la conservation. Une sentinelle, donc, euh, peut, peut devenir une clé de lecture pour comprendre l'écosystème et la culture qui l'ont généré, mais aussi les risques qui menacent son existence et, et les possibles solutions. Risques et solutions euh, émergent euh, des discussions avec les producteurs dans un processus de reconnaissance de l'importance de ces produits et des moyens les plus efficaces pour les protéger et les promouvoir. Euh, ça, c'est le processus lié à l'établissement d'une sentinelle. Donc, en Afrique du Nord, entre euh, Maroc, Algérie, Tunisie et Égypte, il existe sept sites SIPAM, dont trois sont aussi le siège de Sentinels Le Food. Euh, je les liste brièvement. Euh, les, les systèmes agro-silvo-pastoral de l'Arganie, au Maroc, où nous avons une sentinelle sur euh, l'huile alimentaire traditionnelle, qui est liée à la protection de, 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 de ce savoir-faire ancestral, mais aussi à la gestion de, de la forêt d'Arganie. Il y a euh, un autre site, SIPAM, c'est euh, les oasis froides euh, du Haut Atlas, toujours au Maroc, euh, là où nous avons la sentinelle du safran, qui est strictement liée aux terrasses euh, des villages euh, établis au-dessus des 1400, 1400 mètres avec des systèmes d'irrigation gravitaire traditionnels. Euh, ensuite, nous avons l'oasis de Siwa en Égypte. Euh, là, nous avons la sentinelle des dates de Siwa, qui protège non seulement la biodiversité des dates euh, contre les monocultures monovariétales des dates qui sont en train de s'imposer un peu partout, mais aussi euh, défend le modèle d'agroforesterie à niveau ou en couche, euh, dont je vais parler tout à l'heure. Presque tous les sites SIPAM et les sites d'établissement des sentinelles de food en Afrique du Nord ont des caractéristiques communes. Premièrement, elles se trouvent dans des oasis, que ce soit en montagne ou en plaine. Elles représentent donc euh, le modèle le plus extrême et le plus parfait d'agroforesterie. En dehors de l'oasis, il y a le désert. À l'intérieur de l'oasis, par contre, il y a des systèmes d'irrigation traditionnels et une méthode de cultivation en couche euh, qui ne permet la, la survivance et, les, et, le, et, et la balance. Au niveau plus haut de, de ce système, il y a les palmiers, en dessous desquels il y a des arbres plus bas, tels que les oliviers ou les grenadiers ou les amandiers, en dessous desquels, euh, au niveau du sol, il y a les cultivations maraîchères et fourragères. Ces systèmes artificiels très anciens sont gérés par euh, les communautés locales qui maintiennent la, euh, ce, ce, cet équilibre euh, fragile et qui permet l'existence, euh, mais qui est en danger, notamment à cause de l'exode rural, et, mais aussi de, de l'usage de considéré de l'eau par l'agriculture industrielle et pour euh, euh, l'agriculture industrielle pour l'exportation et, et, et les établissements touristiques. Euh, deuxièmement, ces sites, euh, SIPAM et d'établissement de sentinelles, euh, englobent presque toujours euh, des artefacts de construction en pierre sèche. Par ailleurs, l'art de la construction en pierre sèche est patrimoine UNESCO. Donc, quand je parle d'artefacts de, de, de construction en, 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 pierre sèche, en pierre sèche, je me réfère bien sûr, aux paysages terrassés, qui sont des dispositifs euh, essentiels de la vie euh, et de la production dans les montagnes, mais aussi dans, dans les pentes, pas forcément en montagne. Euh, je me réfère aussi au système d'irrigation traditionnel des oasis, euh, par exemple les canates ou les ketara, euh, qui sont des, des galeries souterraines, euh, qui, sont, qui ont une légère pente qui permet l'eau de s'écouler parfois de très loin, par exemple euh, de l'Atlas au Maroc jusqu'aux jusqu oasis. Euh, mais aussi, il y a euh, parmi les, toujours les, les artefacts de, de construction en pierre sèche, les murs 
de soutenement de l'idée Wadi. Wadi est le terme générique euh, désignant un fleuve euh, d'Afrique du Nord ou Moyen-Orient euh, des régions semi-désertiques, c'est-à-dire c'est des, des lits de fleuves qui sont presque toujours secs, euh, mais qui s'animent euh, quand il y a des, des, des pluies qui normalement sont très fortes. Euh, et donc provo euh, provoque des, des écoulements très, très violents et qui ont besoin donc de, 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 de ces euh, des murs de soutenement. Euh, donc ces, ces éléments que j'ai nommés, donc le système agroforestier des oasis et les artefacts de la construction en pierre sèche caractérisent, euh, caractérisent les paysages de la région et sont fonctionnels, bien sûr, à l'agriculture, donc à la vie elle-même, dans, euh, dans des zones arides et montagneuses. Et, et c'est pourquoi ils constituent euh, des éléments distinctifs, tant dans la définition des sites SIPAN euh, que dans le contexte d'une sentinelle slow food. Euh, cependant, les sentinelles, tout comme euh, les sites SIPAN, ne sont pas en mesure à elles seules de bloquer l'exode rural ou la perte de connaissances ou de biodiversité ou encore l'abandon des zones les plus difficiles. Et donc l'idée de, de promouvoir le, le tourisme euh, dans les sites SIPAM, euh, dont j'ai entendu parler dans, lors de, de, de ce webinaire, mais aussi dans, dans les précédents, euh, euh, je pense que c'est une voie possible, mais, mais qui ne passe un risque. Euh, grâce aussi à l'expérience que nous avons de, de Slow Food Travel, euh, un projet Slow Food, euh, notamment sur le tourisme, nous savons que la promotion du tourisme, euh, d'un tourisme sans directive solide pour les acteurs locaux, euh, en, particulier, en particulier les producteurs, les restaurateurs et les, les établissements d'hébergement, risque de devenir un boomerang par rapport à l'idée de sauvegarder l'authenticité et la durabilité d'un site rural historique. Donc, je, je vais dire deux mots sur le projet Slow Food Travel. Euh, donc, euh, il s'agit du, du projet le plus récent de Slow Food, pensé pour impliquer et créer des synergies entre les différents acteurs d'un territoire, notamment les producteurs, les cuisiniers, euh, les, les établissements d'hébergement, donc les gîtes, les maisons d'hôtes, etc dans un parcours de reconnaissance de leur territoire et de soutien réciproque, mais aussi de respect euh, des critères spécifiques pour chaque filière. Donc le résultat sera une communauté accueillante qui peut introduire les visiteurs et les touristes à la connaissance profonde d'un lieu, grâce aux produits et aux producteurs liés à l'histoire et à la culture locale, qui s'expriment aussi par ces plats et recettes. Potentiellement, je pense, du moins euh, en voyant ce qu'il ce qu y a en, en Afrique du Nord, euh, tous les sites SIPAM peuvent accueillir un projet sur le food travel ou des sentinelles, car un paysage rural historique qui a conservé sa vocation agricole euh, n'a probablement pas perdu toute sa biodiversité, même si malheureusement ça peut arriver. La biodiversité alimentaire euh, qui reste peut devenir une sentinelle et contribuer à défendre non seulement les produits en danger, mais aussi les paysages, euh, c'est-à-dire le cadre de vie des communautés qui y vivent, euh, tel qu'il a été défini par la Convention européenne du paysage, que je voudrais citer. Paysage désigne une partie du territoire tel que perçu par les populations, dont le caractère résulte de l'action des facteurs naturels et ou humains et de leur interrelation. Donc la Convention européenne du paysage a été ratifiée en 2005 et indique les chemins à suivre par tout acteur qui veut contribuer à faire des paysages la vraie maison des communautés qui les habitent. Je cite encore, la participation citoyenne est, est un élément essentiel de la sensibilisation à la valeur du patrimoine culturel et à sa contribution au bien-être et à la qualité de vie. Dans ce contexte, les États sont appelés à promouvoir un processus de valorisation participatif basé sur la synergie entre institutions publiques 
particuliers associations. Donc, il s'agit euh, d'un parcours que Slow Food Travel essaie d'appliquer euh, dans, dans les territoires où, où, les, où ils s'activent, euh, s'inspirant aussi de l'expérience des écumusées euh, qui sont depuis des années actives et en, premi, en, pierre, en première ligne dans l'application de la Convention européenne du paysage. Donc, un, un parcours d'appropriation du patrimoine local et de rétablissement des liens communautaires est donc nécessaire euh, parce qu'ils sont hum, devenus désormais faibles pratiquement partout. Et, mais ce rétablissement euh, doit être aussi accompagné par euh, un système de garantie pour s'assurer que les lignes directives d'un projet tel que le Food Travel soient effectivement respectées. Un système qui peut être réalisé seulement avec l'implication forte de la communauté. Euh, tout ce que je viens de, de dire, euh, qui était un peu l'objet de, de ma réflexion quand on m'a demandé de, de, de trouver des ponts, en fait, euh, de souligner les aspects de convergence entre CIPA et Slow Food. Donc, tout cela me fait penser que euh, euh, CIPA et Slow Food pourraient converger dans, dans des projets communs, non seulement à travers des sentinelles qui sont écosystémiques, dans les sites de CIPAM, mais aussi en proposant des modèles de tourisme durable ancrés dans les communautés locales, comme par exemple sur le food travel, régulé par des lignes directrices et des systèmes de garantie euh, participatifs. Euh, car, et là je conclue, tant qu'il ne sera pas naturel de trouver dans les restaurants des plats non seulement typiques, mais aussi préparés à partir de matières premières locales, il ne sera pas possible de parler de paysages vraiment authentiques. Euh, je vous remercie et je rends la parole à Eddy. Je reste à disposition pour des questions. Merci. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Nazarena, for that uh, uh, well elaborated presentation. It's really uh, important that at the beginning, in my opening remarks, I hinted uh, on uh, um, creating or supporting those development mechanisms that respect the value of the globally uh, important agricultural heritage sites. And uh, the proposals which uh, Nazarena has put forward are some of these initiatives that can add value uh, uh, to, to these sites and also to uh, the people who are preserving these sites. It's really important to create this linkage. linkage. And in one of the practical examples of uh, what, Valent uh, what uh, Nazarena has been talking about, um, we will uh, have uh, to welcome our next speaker who is uh, uh, going to talk about a concrete example of a slow food presidium and traditional ecosystems. Uh, of uh, Ballast Land. Uh, please welcome uh, Suhad Azenot. Uh, she's the coordinator of the Reef Encon um, Wheat Presidium and of the Slow Food uh, Ballast Community for Biodiversity. Uh, please, uh, Suhad. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Alors, uh, tout d'abord, je remercie, je vous remercie vraiment de m'avoir invité d'être uh, parmi uh, ces éminents panélistes. Euh, le thème de mon intervention en rapport avec euh, le sujet abordé, euh, cet après-midi, ça sera Pays des Chevela comme système ingénieux, effectivement, du patrimoine agricole mondial de, euh, euh, au, niveau, au niveau du monde entier. Ça, ça peut être, vraiment, ça peut être un modèle euh, de, de, de ce système ingénieux. Alors, euh, la, la présentation portera sur un bref descriptif de la communauté des Jvela, puis sera abordé l'importance des agrosystèmes de notre région en insistant surtout sur le petit épôtre qui dessine effectivement avec l'olivier et l'oléastre et aussi le figuier, les paysages du rythme. Je pense qu'on peut insérer ma présentation. Bien. Alors... Euh, en fait, le pays des Jvela occupe la majeure partie du rift occidental et central, 
depuis le détroit jusqu'au pays d'Ouarra. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a un problème avec la présentation Parce que il y a des slides qui dessinent bien les figures. Bon, je vais continuer. Alors, euh, le pays de Jvela se caractérise, par des, se caractérise par des chaînes montagneuses les plus peuplées du bassin méditerranéen, effectivement. Aussi, il y a une forme d'habitat groupé et structuré suivant des systèmes d'organisation traditionnels basés sur les liens familiaux et tribaux avec une prédominance de la population rurale. C'est ce qui explique qu'il y a une agriculture traditionnelle, familiale et agro-biodiversité qui dessine notre paysage montagneux. Alors, les agro-systèmes de nos campagnes sont caractérisés par la coexistence d'un système silvo-pastoral et d'une activité agricole de subsistance. Ils forment des unités paysagères particulières les agro-écosystèmes traditionnels de montagne. Euh, ce sont des systèmes vivants, évolutifs et associant, associant d'une façon étroite des communautés humaines à leur territoire. Euh, les principales caractéristiques de ce système sont euh, l'agriculture traditionnelle donc, de subsistance, la pratique de, de la polyculture, la prédominance de la petite propriété, euh, la culture des variétés locales, le maintien des cultures euh, marginales et euh, le recours au savoir-faire traditionnel. Euh, la pratique de l'agriculture traditionnelle favorise effectivement la diversification des modes d'occupation de territoire. Le paysage est composé, euh, nos paysages sont composés d'une mosaïque de milieux cultivés comme par exemple les cultures ou les jachères, euh, euh, des euh, milieux naturels comme les forêts et semi-naturels comme les haies et les chemins. Ce type de paysage favorise la conservation de la biodiversité, effectivement, et euh, spécialement la richesse et la diversité de la flore euh, locale, qui, a, qui est une flore aussi endémique de la région. Euh, à noter aussi euh, la richesse variétale des fruitiers, spécialement euh, chez le fruitier et chez le figuier, qui est un élément caractéristique des agrosystèmes du rythme. Euh, on peut identifier un nombre impressionnant de variétés euh, ou dénominations locales euh, et on peut répertorier plus de 25 variétés, euh, jusqu'à 30 variétés de figuier. La culture des céréales marginales comme le petit épeautre, le seigle, etc., avec les légumineuses comme les fèves, les févroles, en culture intercalaire avec les arbres fruitiers, principalement donc l'olivier, le figuier, et cela euh, vraiment renforce la typicité de nos, de nos territoires. Euh, nos paysages dénotent une ver, une véritable, un véritable refuge de l'agro-biodiversité, euh, et c'est dans ce contexte qu'on a pu maintenir vraiment la culture du petit épôtre, euh, ce monstre ancestral qui était en voie de disparition. Euh, je ne sais pas euh, pourquoi on n'a pas pu voir, euh, il y avait des photos de paysages et tout, ma présentation n'a pas pu être insérée. Je, bon, je, vais, je vais continuer. Alors, euh, en effet, la sauvegarde du petit épôtre euh, en tant que sentinelle et sa conduite euh, en respectant ses agroécosystèmes, à savoir l'association avec euh, l'olivier. En association avec euh, l'olivier et d'autres arbres fruitiers dans notre région, permet de pérenniser le travail des anciens, d'avoir un produit excellent pour la santé, parce qu'on cultive en agroécologie, en agroforesterie, donc ça permet vraiment aux plantes d'avoir un bénéfice santé extraordinaire et aux plantes d'être vraiment saintes euh, et surtout de sauvegarder aussi la typicité de nos paysages, effectivement. Alors, euh, pour conclure, ah, enfin, <rire> alors, euh, euh, pour conclure, euh, je dirais que les particularités locales relevées au niveau de notre système de production 
de l'agroécosystème et de l'agrobiodiversité sont tellement bien prononcées qu'elles dénotent qu'elle démontre une remarque typicité géographique, effectivement. Euh, les caractéristiques de cet espace à dimension non seulement géographique, mais également humaine et culturelle, sont bien visibles dans nos campagnes et plaident pour la différenciation, effectivement, d'un territoire et d'un paysage. Euh, donc, euh, terroir d'un pays, des euh, Et je conclurai qu'il serait vraiment intéressant de l'inscrire comme système ingénieux du patrimoine agricole mondial, effectivement. On peut, on peut défiler les photos. Il y a des photos qui montrent bien nos, notre paysage. On peut vraiment défiler les photos. Et, et donc, je vous remercie de votre attention. Et je reste vraiment à votre disposition pour plus de, de questions ou de précisions. Je vous remercie. Cette photo-là, cette photo-là, j'ai quelque chose à rajouter. Alors, cette photo-là, on voit les briques en terre qu'on a faites cet été et on attend qu'il fasse un peu plus beau pour construire un grenier traditionnel en briques en terre. Et, et, et ça sera un grenier où on va mettre les semences du petit épôtre. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Suhat. That is uh, very interesting and the pictures really uh, look nice and it's a very beautiful landscape. And uh, congratulations for, uh, for your work. Um, I would like to remind you that uh, the question and answer uh, icon is uh, still active. You can put any question for uh, any of the uh, panelists, first of all, thank you to all our panelists and thanks, uh, big thanks to those who have uh, uh, dropped their questions in the Q&A uh, icon. And um, I have uh, quite a few questions uh, which are still uh, uh, unanswered. Um, uh, and I'd like to welcome the panelists uh, uh, who have been uh, um, specifically directed to these uh, questions uh, to answer them. And uh, first, uh, one of the questions is from uh, uh, John uh, Chiwagalo, and uh, he's uh, asking about uh, uh, the eligibility uh, criteria for selection of students. I think he's uh, talking about the capacity building project. And um, he comes down to tag the question to Professor Agnoletti and asking how can a young person coordinating agroforestry programs from Africa be part of the capacity building program? Uh, Professor Agnoletti, uh, uh, the floor is yours uh, to respond to, to this question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the question, since I did not have time to explain the selection uh, criteria. Uh, first of all, as I already explained, uh, the project uh, uh, has mainly financed uh, in terms of uh, accepting students and covering, of course, the expenses for the travel, lodging and, and receive the teaching. Uh, are, the main criteria is the fact that they uh, should come from the country listed in the cooperation abroad program of the Italian agency. So this is uh, the first criteria. Of course, uh, out of this uh, uh, source uh, of support, uh, we have other funding uh, sources, uh, as I explained before, so from the FAO directly, the GS program, and also from the regional government uh, of uh, Tuscany. In this case, uh, these uh, criteria, so being uh, uh, from a, coming from a country or the uh, Italian program of cooperation, does not matter. We can accept even students coming from other countries. Uh, and this 
concerning the geographic provenance. And the other criteria concern the curriculum. Uh, in this respect, uh, we are open to many different backgrounds. So we are not accepting just students coming from the faculties of agriculture or forestry or uh, 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 studies uh, related to, to, the, to this topic. We, the coordination committee decided to open up uh, from different backgrounds. So we have people coming from the sociological study, economic study, from biology, even from uh, languages. Mm -hmm. So people, the people coming from studies in literature. And at the beginning, we were a bit in doubt of opening up uh, to this kind of uh, skills. But at the end, uh, we noticed that the best students uh, often are not the one coming from agriculture. Some of the best students come from other sites. We have even good students from architecture. So the, 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 the background, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, a matter of selection. So there is not a priority given by the background from where of the, of the study that's strictly related to, to rural areas. So, and the, the other, uh, another criteria is that is the quality of the curriculum and uh, so the, the fact that uh, they already had uh, experiences uh, in, in the field, uh, once again, you may have experience being an economist in rural development or in development that can be considered a world of interest as you can be a biologist working or have been work for uh, organization dealing with, with biodiversity. So in this respect, uh, this uh, uh, is a selection criteria, of course, in this, we are supported also by Dr. Focacci, who is in charge of coordinating the, pro the project uh, on behalf of the Italian Agency for the Cooperation Abroad. And also there is a, not a, a strict uh, rule concerning the age uh, in the sense that normally we prefer uh, young people. But uh, what we like to have, and this is one of the criteria that we apply in selecting uh, when we receive 60, 70 application, at least in the last two edition, is to have a, a high a diversity from uh, in terms of background and countries, uh, and also in, and to have a, a, to be balanced in terms of gender. So we have many women uh, uh, willing to attend, uh, and statistically we see they, they are better off than the, the, the males in terms of uh, being successful in, in, in completing uh, the, their studies. I don't know why, why this is happening, but I don't know if this statistic can be applied to any to other studies, but uh, we, we have uh, taken over uh, also after the course. Uh, so we, there are position, uh, temporary position open in FAO for them, the best student also several of them found a job in their own countries and I have to say that uh, several girls were quite successful both in the quality of the final thesis uh, in the average uh, uh, result in terms of exam exams uh, and so this is something we are not, we are not uh, really uh, looking at this uh, as something that we will uh, select but the results of, of our uh, uh, master course are, are this. Thank you, uh, Professor Agnoletti, uh, for this elaborate uh, response to John's question. Uh, um, other questions, uh, there is a question also from uh, James asking uh, the difference between uh, uh, traditional and indigenous agroforestry systems. I think this is a question which uh, uh, goes uh, directly to uh, Professor Alfred. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Adi. Thank you. Uh, there's a huge difference between the two terms. Um, traditional is actually referring to a body, a cumulative body of knowledge, um, which is um, a part of the practice and belief system of a group. So that becomes traditional, tradition, the body of knowledge. But indigenous actually comes from the word indigen, 
which also refers to endemic. People, it's referring to a group of people who are uh, localized in a particular area. So they become an indigenous group of people who live in a particular culture, or whatever that it is. And the interesting thing is, um, uh, if you want to look at Africa in the real sense of uh, tradition, yes, we do have, or every country has a group, local people who speak this language and they have special diets, special lifestyles, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to indigenous, now that word be very, very difficult to apply in Africa, because the people, uh, except in places where they were displaced by another group, in which case you can refer to that group as far as I can see right now, all the way they are all local people. They are all local people. And that is why when we refer to the uh, indigenous people, we also make mention of local communities. In fact, that is the terminology that is used at the international level now. Indigenous people in local communities. And so, um, uh, the person who asked for the difference, tradition is referring to just a cumulative body of knowledge, practices and beliefs. And indigenous is referring to a group of people who are identified by their culture or by their traditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Alfred. Um, there is one last question which uh, uh, came up about uh, uh, from Le Rebecca um, asking about uh, how uh, the traditional, uh, how the, the coordinator, uh, asking, asking a question to the coordinators of uh, Slow Food uh, uh, Presidia and how this Presidia uh, can be used as a tool for preserving uh, 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 local knowledge and biodiversity. I uh, forward this question to Nazarena uh, for the response to Rebecca. Oui, merci, uh, merci Rebecca pour uh, pour ta question. Um, en fait, uh, les Sentinelles Slow Food, uh, c'est l'un des, des des premiers et les plus importants projets des Slow Food et qui, et qui sonnaient justement pour préserver les, la biodiversité et les connaissances liées à, à certaines productions qui étaient en danger de disparaître. Et donc, comment est-ce qu'on peut les utiliser pratiquement pour, pour défendre cette biodiversité et ses, ses savoir-faire bah, Avant tout, bah, une sentinelle, c'est déjà, c'est pas un produit, c'est un groupe de producteurs qui encore produisent ou euh, élèvent la race animale ou euh, transforment pour la, pour la, la, la conservation. Donc, c'est des producteurs qui encore euh, utilisent ces pratiques euh, des agricoles ou des transformations. Euh, euh, et, et qui donc, et qui généralement, ne sont pas compétitifs sur le marché parce que, comme il a été très bien dit euh, beaucoup de fois aussi par euh, professeur Agnoletti, euh, euh, il y a un problème des de, de marginalités des de, de ces zones très souvent, donc une, une agriculture de petite échelle. Euh, et, et de, un difficile accès au marché, par exemple. Donc, en établissant une sentinelle et en démarrant un processus d'accompagnement euh, à ces producteurs, qui signifie se rencontrer, définir ensemble le, le cahier de charge pour euh, 
euh, définir quelles sont les, les menaces à, à la production, mais aussi les, les possibles solutions. Et ça, c'est un parcours qu'on qu fait tout, euh, ensemble. Euh, une fois que la sentinelle est établie, Slow Food a un rôle aussi de communicateur. Euh, par exemple, euh, par exemple, en participant à des conférences comme euh, Madame Suad Azenoud <rire> est en train de faire ce, ce soir, euh, ou participant à Terra Madre Salone de Gusto avec des chefs qui, qui, qui cuisinent le, leurs produits, qui les mettent en valeur, par des articles qui, euh, qui parlent de, de tous les contextes, comme, comme je dis, disais tout à l'heure, de, de tout le tout l'écosystème en fait, qui abrite et qui, et qui accueille ces, ces sentinelles. Donc, le Food a beaucoup un rôle de, de plaidoyer euh, de, et de communicateur de, de ces produits et de, de ces contextes, des contextes dans lesquels euh, les sentinelles sont, sont établies. J'espère avoir répondu. Euh, je, je peux ajouter quelque chose à ce sujet-là Please, briefly. Oui. Alors, euh, euh, je, ce que j'ajouterai par rapport à ce qu'a dit Nazarena, c'est que je vais donner un exemple très parlant. C'est qu'en tant que sentinelle petite et poutre, on a été contacté euh, euh, il n'y a même pas une journée par euh, quelqu'un de. Et ils veulent faire euh, un film ou un documentaire sur les semences anciennes. Et euh, ils nous ont contactés. Et en fait, comment ils ont connu notre adresse C'est à travers Slow Food. Euh, donc, Slow Food euh, nous met en avant. Elle communique parce que nous, on a, effectivement, nous sommes dans des zones enclavées. On n'a pas, pas les possibilités de communiquer. Et donc, Slow Food joue très bien ce rôle. Et, et là, ils veulent venir faire, faire un tournage à notre niveau, pour mettre en avant, effectivement, cette sauvegarde de semences anciennes. Donc, voilà, c'est une très bonne chose. Et puis aussi, c'est toute une équipe qui va venir, donc ça va permettre aussi de, de faire du tourisme et donc de rentabiliser donc, le gîte, etc. Donc, voilà. Thank you, uh, thank you, so, uh, Soad, for that uh, addition to Nazarena's uh, submission. Um, for more uh, uh, for more information uh, uh, about uh, uh, or more any questions about the uh, globally important agricultural heritage sites, do not hesitate to contact uh, the FAO uh, directly at GI. Uh, AHS uh, dash secretariat at FAO.org. Uh, that is a comment uh, 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 from uh, Roberto. So uh, we are coming to the end of this uh, forum. I don't see any other questions uh, coming up. Um, I would like to thank uh, all the Uh, participants, all the uh, uh, panelists uh, from my side. But to wrap up uh, 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 and close this forum, I would like to invite Professor uh, uh, Mauro Agnoletti uh, to uh, give uh, some closing remarks and uh, also uh, wrap up the whole discussion. Professor uh, Mauro Agnoletti. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, not only the organization of Slow Food, uh, but also all those who have attended this meeting. For me, it was very interesting. I'm sorry that uh, uh, I don't see here Professor Alfred uh, Ewang, but uh, as he mention uh, it was uh, uh, <laughs> I was pressing him very much in order to attend to to this meeting and uh, first of all as a general comment since we are now at the third webinar we are organizing together with the food uh, I noticed and I'm very happy to say we are slowly 
entering more and more into the content of what could be and are the relationship between uh, the activities of the food and the GS. There is already a, a document concerning the collaboration between the two. But uh, what I was hoping uh, organizing this seminar with the food is uh, really to come into some kind of practical aspect on how we can integrate the two program. And I see there are uh, really very important and strong uh, uh, matters that uh, we are dealing with that could really uh, reinforce uh, both parties. I mean, that, that those uh, who are uh, involved uh, into selection and the designation of GSI, uh, those who are involved into the identification of potential GSI, because even in our case, we have identify more than 40 potential GSI, uh, whether it's possible not to be able to let this site become a real GSI. What we are discovering is there are many, many places in the world that are uh, worth of interest and independently whether the, from the fact they can become officially a GSI, there are areas that are worth uh, of interest and area where slow food can actually develop their activity and where we are very interested in developing our activity because at the end what we are spreading around the world is a message concerning all the the content of the criteria of, of, of the GS program there are two and important even without being officially designated obviously the the, the hope is to become more and more, and if I have to say, since I've been working and I'm still working with, with UNESCO, what, what, I, what I would like to stress is that uh, differently from UNESCO, where we're looking for uniqueness and outstanding universal values uh, in places that are often uh, described and uh, framed inside the UNESCO criteria, often for the form, design, and aesthetic purposes. So here, the approach is different. Uh, obviously, they must be of global importance, but uh, our interest to find uh, more and more of this site across the world uh, to make this uh, community of uh, uh, these rural communities uh, uh, working in the in this in this system uh, stronger and more important uh, so to be uh, uh, worth of attention uh, and to work in developing uh, this uh, local economy because that's what what we need uh, is not simply selecting one site that we can solve this problem but in indicating and proposing this example we send out a message across the world so in this respect i think the collaborative with the food is very important and also what we heard today is that is something that not too many people knows uh, traditional forest knowledge uh, as uh, somehow uh, professor uh, uh, otenga remembered uh, is was part of an activity uh, is still, sorry, a part of the activity of the UFRO, International Union of Forestry Research Organization, for 10 years I've been the chair of the research group on forest history and traditional knowledge. Uh, so this connection between forest history and traditional knowledge is very important. And being in the world of forestry, it's also very important because another thing that few people know is that uh, uh, this uh, element of traditional knowledge is inside the sustainable foreign management uh, uh, criteria at world level. Specifically in Europe, uh, we have three pillars of sustainable forest management. Uh, one is the ecological one, the second is the economic one, the third is the social cultural one. So as, as a matter of fact, uh, there is a, a part of the sustainability of uh, in, in forestry that is related to traditional knowledge and in fact, Speaking about, uh, as, as you heard uh, from Professor Oteng, about uh, uh, not only shifting cultivation, but also by a slash and burn, uh, I have to say that we have uh, included several sites in the GS program where people do this shifty cultivation and slash and burn, which is something that pays off a wisdom uh, inherited uh, uh, through the generation and it's not destroying the forest, uh, it's simply managing uh, the forest and finding uh, a way to sustain the local communities that are 
very good ecologist, I would say, because they know they know what they're doing uh, in, in general. So I have to say that this uh, idea of uh, not only agroforestry, but agroforestry related to uh, systems, agroforestry system and GS, uh, is something that can involve even many more communities, many more areas of the world that we know, and specifically in Africa, there's enormous wealth uh, of uh, her enormous heritage about this, that uh, still we are not completely exploring, but having traveled there, I found that there is an immense knowledge about this system, even in uh, an area in the desert that may not be considered an example of, uh, an example of uh, agroforests like the, the one that we find in Central Africa. Let's think about the Argan forest in Morocco, for instance. Uh, there is a, a huge knowledge in this system that is uh, very much related uh, with both the topic uh, uh, in which slow food is involved and in which GS is involved. Uh, and even the ecological role of this plantation is not too much no so so, so much explorer because people have a vogue idea what does it mean in terms of ecology when you have an, an argon forest so this is something very important another thing that is very important it's uh, when uh, we've been speaking about tourism what kind of tourism we would like in this area and so in general terms i would say we like to have uh, informed tourists, people go there and are not destroying the places. And I have to say that this is another important matter because unfortunately, mm -hmm. as in UNESCO site, but already in GS site, is happening that when you have too many tourists, you introduce socioeconomic uh, developments that are negatively affecting the quality of the site. Uh, many farmers change jobs, they start to be hotel owners uh, or to open a, a restaurant, which is a very good thing until this is changing uh, the uh, social and economic structure of the place. Uh, and so there are cases in GSI where you really are importing food from outside, not to support the local community, which was perfectly living out of their own resources, but to support the tourists going there. So as a matter of fact, what we would need to do is to uh, promote a high quality tourists, which means uh, someone who is uh, ready to go in this area, who knows what is there, who knows the rules uh, of moving and uh, also enjoying in this area. And so as from the parties of uh, the GSI, so the local authorities who so have to schedule and to plan for having this quality of tourists, also from this side of the tourists, uh, from, from I'm very much enjoying when people tell me that uh, having a GS site, you have an increase of tourism, but I have to say that I've noticed uh, in several places that things can turn bad. So we, we, we need to be very careful when we want to uh, take advantage of tourism in order to promote uh, these uh, places. So in, in the respect, I have to say that this uh, idea also supporting agroforestry, it's a, it's a very good idea also for having a, a sustainability, which is linked to the use of trees and plants that may not be considered a dense homogeneous forest as many people think that is the only forest that can be, is the one that is covering uh, an entire portion of a territory. In some cases, there is a, a different kind of forest which is based more on trees or in group of trees that can develop their own role in terms of carbon dioxide, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of economy, and be places for producing food, which is exactly what the board is looking for. We presented uh, the GS uh, at the COP23 in, in Europe, in Bonn, where GS was presented as one of the examples that can combine all these different needs uh, and can propose what you always try to look for in this technical meeting, not in the big declaration at the end, going for the press, but when you're discussing real things, we are looking for a solution. We are looking for example, we're looking for a vision that need to accomplish all the different needs of the population and also the needs, of course, of the climate and, uh, and also the conservation of the environment. So I thank you very much for your attention. I hope we will can continue to discuss with several of you this development. So Eddie, maybe you can close the meeting at this point.
Thank you so much, Professor Gioletti, for the very encouraging and interesting uh, closing re remarks. Thank you all to uh, the uh, participants, the panelists, and also our technical team. It's been a pleasure to host you to this very important forum that speaks directly to the future of heritage systems of our concern. Thank you and uh, goodbye. The future of our planet is decided at the table, in our daily food choices. What do we know about what we eat? How do we choose? Where do we buy it? You can make a difference and contribute to a future where everyone has access to food that is good. Eating must be a pleasure for everyone. We all have a right to food that is healthy, natural, fresh, and seasonal. Clean. Being aware helps us to choose food that is good for our health and the health of our planet. Fair. Knowing our food means making choices that are fair to us, to the producers, and to future generations. Slow Food has been working for over 30 years to defend biodiversity and fight the climate crisis by promoting good, clean, and fair food for all. slowfood.com slash en and follow us at Terra Madre